We're there in Matthew chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, where the Bible reads, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born of the king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. Now, of course, we're going chapter by chapter through the book of Matthew, and, and there's just so many great things here. And what I love about this verse here is that it says, We have seen his star. It's very interesting. It says he has seen his star, meaning I believe that at this time there likely was just a star that was that God put in that sky at that time and has since taken away when, when Christ the Savior is born. What a miracle that is. And that these men were here were looking for that star. And what I, what I find interesting is that we're seeing here that even back then that Gentiles, people who were not of the nation of Israel, were looking to the heavens for evidence of God. They were looking to the heavens to know the Savior. They were looking for God to reveal Himself to them. And I think that's an important lesson that we can learn. There's a few things we can learn from that. And it's the fact that, that God reveals Himself through nature. That God wants to show who He is. And the Bible makes it very clear that He will do that through nature, through His creation. I mean, He is the one that created all things, and it's by Him that all things consist and have their being. So it only makes sense that God would use nature to reveal Himself to a, to a lost world. You would turn over to Romans chapter 1. When well, you're turning over to Romans chapter 1, listen as I read from Psalm 19. The Bible says in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. The heavens declare the glory of God. And the firmament showeth His handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Bible saying here that the heavens, their, their voice is heard. The firmament is heard. That the day, the things we see in the day, the sun, the, the things we see by night, the star, the moon, these things declare the glory of God to man. And there is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. No matter where you go in the world, there's a sky. No matter where you go in the world, you're going to see the stars. No matter where you go in the world, you're going to see the sun. There is no place where their language is not heard. So though we might not be able to reach every corner of, of the world, every corner of the globe with the gospel of Christ as we should and as we strive to do, we can know that their voice, the voice of what the heavens declare, can reach those places and declare the glory of God. And I, I always like it when the Bible talks about the stars or the sky because it's, it's a song that's near to my heart and my testimony of how I came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. When I was a, 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 just a young child even, I remember just you know five, six years old, just being out in the backyard playing and looking up at those blue skies and those big billowy white clouds and just thinking about angels in heaven and you know what, what, where is God at? and Just thinking about the things of, of God. Spiritual thoughts for a child. Was it because someone had put some thought in my head or wanted to talk to me about something? There was just something in me that when I beheld His handiwork, caused me to think of spiritual things. I remember when I was a younger man and uh, living you know, unsaved, living a wicked life, living in the West Indies, living on St. Croix where my father lives. And I would go out and, and then there, you know, you can, uh, there's not a lot of light pollution. You can, and you can see constellations there you can't see here. You can see the Southern Cross and other things. But I remember just being out in the back, you know, on those jungle roads looking up and just seeing all the stars and just, just being taken away of just the majesty of creation. And it was at time, that time that I started to really seek and, and wanted to know who God was. And it wasn't long after that that God revealed Himself not only through the glory of, of the heavens, but also, of course, through His Word. And I was preached the Gospel. But it was those things. It was the stars. It was the skies. It was the firmament that declared the glory of God that began to work in my heart and make me to think on the things of God make me to think that there is a Creator. That this all didn't just happen. I mean, I don't understand how anybody can... Look at all that majesty and glory of the stars of a night sky. we got these telescopes that look into deep space and they show you these just magnificent things that just stretch out for eternity and not think that there's a creator, but think that this just all happened. It's foolish. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Because the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. But you know, some people, they refuse to accept what the heavens declare. Their hearts are hard, and they are just, you know, hell-bent on rejecting Christ. 
And the Bible says there in Romans chapter 1, verse 20, for the invisible things of Him, the things about God that we cannot see, from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Meaning when we look at the world, when we look at His creation, those things we cannot see about God are seen. We can under look at the world and understand there is a Creator. Being understood by the things that are made, that's us. We are made by Him. We are made in His image. And we can look at the things that He has made and clearly see that there is a God. Even His eternal power and Godhead. So that they are without excuse. Their voice has gone out into all the world. And we always get that hypothetical question out soul winning. Well, what about the person who's never heard? Well, the Bible says that their voice is heard. There is no place where their voice is not heard. And it, and it just leads me to think and know and understand that if people want to know the truth about God and who He is, like I did as a younger man, they will find Him. The Bible says in Matthew, Ask, and it shall be given unto you. Seek, and He shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. You see, God wants to be found. God's not playing some you know, cosmic, intergalactic game of hide and seek. Where he's trying to put this puzzle together and he's trying to get you to figure it out. The things, are the, uh, the creation of this world, it, it, the, the invisible things of him are clearly seen by the things that are made. He wants to be found. Go ahead and turn over to Romans chapter 10. The Bible says in Jeremiah 29, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And then shall ye call on me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. And ye shall seek me and find me. And ye shall search for me with all your heart. And I will be found of you, saith the Lord. God wants to be found. The problem is people don't want to find Him. They don't want to seek after Him with their heart. They don't want to knock. They don't want to ask. And that's why they don't receive. But that does not mean that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. Because their voice, the voice of God is, is heard throughout all creation. But that doesn't mean we should just sit back and say, well, if people really want to find out, they will. If people really want to know who God is, God will get somebody over there. Have this Calvinistic idea that you know, somehow people that are supposed to be saved will just get saved somehow. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 20, <clears throat> 20 <clears throat> that Isaiah is very bold and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. You know, God wants to be found of people who are not seeking Him. That's why we go out door to door. That's why we go knock on doors. People who have lived their whole life without a spiritual thought, without a care in the world about spiritual matters, don't think about eternity. Don't think about where they're going to go tonight. They're just living for the world, just living for the flesh, going in at, and day in and day out, going through the motions, just living this life, just rolling the dice and saying, well, let's just see what happens when I die. I'm not really that concerned. They're not seeking. And that's why we go out and we find them that sought Him not. And we present them to the Lord. Amen. It reminds me of these wise men. <clears throat> you go back and to Romans, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 2. It says, It was the men of the east coming to worship the king of the Jews. Isn't that interesting? That it was these men from a foreign land. It was the men of the east coming to worship the king of the Jews. Coming into Israel, seeking him there. And I just love that because it shows us that even at his birth, Jesus Christ is inviting all nations unto him. Just as he, as he told Abraham, in, in thy seed shall all nations be blessed. Not just one particular nation, not just one particular group of people are going to be blessed by God, but that even the men that are far off are going to come and seek Him and find Him. <clears throat> that God is inviting all nations unto Him, even at His birth. Go ahead and turn over Ephesians chapter 2. Actually, turn over Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'll read from Ephesians 2 while you go to Ephesians 4. Wherefore, remember that ye, being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by that which is called the circumcision, in the flesh made by hands, that at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who are sometimes far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ." 
These men of the East who were far off were brought nigh to Christ. It reminds me of us. What was it that makes us nigh? What was it that brings us close to Christ? It says it's the blood. We are made nigh by the blood of Christ. You see, the only blood that counts, it's not the blood of some particular race. It's not the blood of some particular group of people. It's the blood of Christ that counts. That's, it's not some genealogy. It's not some heritage. It's not some, you know special group of people Amen. that want to just claim God all to themselves. It's not their blood. It's not the blood in your veins that's going to get you close to Christ. It's going to get you to heaven. It's the blood of Christ that brings us nigh. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. For He is our peace who hath made both one and broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished his flesh in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. The Jew and the Gentile, all are one in Christ, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. I love the picture of the men coming from the east, those that were afar off, coming nigh to Christ. The wise men those that were afar off believed and walked by faith where Christ was. While those that were nigh, those that were near, the Jews of that day, they rejected Him. The Bible says in John, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Speaking of Jesus, He was in the world, and the world was made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But it was those that were far off. They received Him. They saw Him. They came near. They were brought nigh by the blood of Christ. We'll move on to verse 3. The Bible says, When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled. He heard these things and he was troubled. He heard that the Christ, the king of the Jews, was born. I mean, if we were to hear that, I mean, we look for the coming of our Savior. We look for Jesus Christ, that blessed hope to come again. I mean, we would get excited. You know, we talk about it sometimes. Well, maybe, maybe he'll come in our lifetime, and how what a thrill that would be. But when Herod heard it, the Bible says he was troubled. Well, why is that? It's because often those that are in authority are threatened by a higher authority. Those that are in higher or in authority are often threatened by those in a higher authority. This man, Herod, was a king. And his authority, when he heard that term king of the Jews, his authority was threatened. He felt threatened. I believe that's what it was. And even now, you know, we can think about it in a broader scope, Satan. Even now, he is threatened in the same way. The Bible says, I'll, you don't have to turn there, but in Revelation it says that, of Satan, it says that his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and it, it cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered to devour her child as soon as it was born. This is speaking of Christ. That Satan, even at the birth of Christ, wanted to devour him, wanted to destroy him, because it, because Christ was a threat to his authority. The Bible says in verse five, it says, "And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron." So we see here in verse three, Herod is troubled. He's threatened by the fact that another king is on the scene. And what does he do? He doesn't submit. He doesn't go along with the program. He takes action. Verse 4, And we had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people. He demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not thou least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So you see, first of all, when Herod, when he decides, hey, this guy's a threat to me, what's the first thing he do? When, when, when another higher authority is coming into his life and he perceives it as a threat and says, and he bucks and says, I'm not going to go along with it, what does he do? He takes action. And, he, and he, he has his leaders come in, his counselors. It says that he gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together. You see, wicked leaders, they often have wicked counselors. 
And it's interesting that the Jews here, they knew the, the Scripture. They knew the prophecy. But you don't find them going to worship. You don't find them going there and trying to find out where Christ was born and seek Him out and bringing Him gifts and worshiping Him and adoring Him. But they're right there ready to help Herod out just like that. Oh, this is where he is. So we see that these wicked leaders, these people like Herod, they deny his authority. They deny his authority. They want nothing to do with him reigning over them. But you know what's interesting is they often they won't deny the fact that he is God. They'll deny his authority, but they will not deny his divinity. <clears throat> what did he demand of them? He demanded of them where Christ should be born. He had full knowledge. He, he had to have understood who this was. And he's asking them, hey, go, go to your holy text, go to your scriptures, and read them and tell me where this Messiah, this Christ, this King of the Jews is going to be born. He had to have understood who he was dealing with. He didn't want Christ's authority. That didn't mean he denied his divinity. That's why it says in Psalm 2, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves together and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed. Who is it that's taking counsel together? The kings of the earth. Men like Herod. Those in authority. Those who are threatened by His superiority. He says there, it says that they, let, that they say, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. They don't, it's not that they're denying who God is. It's just they don't like God. They don't like His rules. They don't like his book. They don't like it cramps their style. They don't like the fact that God you know, wants his people to walk holy and righteously. They want to cast off those cords from them. And that's why often you'll find these wicked rulers, they're reprobate. I mean, they've been getting over. They don't have that God is, is done with them. They hate God so much they don't want to retain God in their knowledge. So God gives them up. You see, wicked people. The other thing we can learn here from Herod is that wicked people desire power. They're threatened. They hate it when their, their power is threatened. They desire power. They desire position. And they will go to great lengths to get it and to maintain it. And we'll see that about Herod. Not only that, but they will infiltrate to gain and maintain power. They won't always just take the threat head on. They won't always just, you know, have a coup and go over there and just, you know, charge the castle and throw the king out. Well, what do they do? They'll sneak in. They'll work in. They'll infiltrate. Look at verse 7. Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when you have found him, bring me word again that I may come to worship him also. He wants them to think, Hey, I'm with you guys. This is great news. I want to worship Him too. But we know from the story, as we'll read here in a minute, that's not at all what He had in mind. But He just couldn't come out and say that, could He? He couldn't just come out and say, hey, I want, to, I want to destroy this child. I want to devour him even when he's born. You see, the, these people, these wicked people that desire power, they'll infiltrate. They'll pretend they're just like one of you to get in positions. Go over and turn over to Acts chapter 20. Again, this keeps up in Matthew 2 all night, but turn over to Acts chapter 20. If you're turning there, I'm going to read it from Jude. The Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you the common salvation, it was needful for me to write to you, unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares. He's saying, look, I'm warning you, you need to contend for the faith because there's people that are going to try to creep in unawares who were before old ordained to this condemnation ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. You're there in Acts chapter 20. people, And this is the thing. People really need to understand this because I, I know I haven't been a faithful word a real long time, but I'm going to tell you something. I've seen it over and over again in my short time. People trying to creep in and people trying to Usurp authority. And, and until you see it for yourself, until it happens, you don't believe it. But the Bible is telling us over and over. It's giving us examples over and over. Look at Acts chapter 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves 
and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this. He didn't say I suspect it. He said, there's a chance. I'm a little concerned. He said, I know this. That after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. Not sparing the flock. These people, these wicked people, like Herod, they are wicked people in this world who do not like the authority of Christ, they do, but they want that position of power. They have wicked lusts in their heart, and they creep in unawares into good churches. And when they're in there, if we're not careful, we might be one of the ones that they don't spare. We might be the ones that get devoured. That's why it's so careful, especially these days, to, to watch your children, to watch one another, to be vigilant, to be careful not to trust people with, with the most precious thing you have. Because it only takes a moment, one moment, and that child can be ruined, scarred. We don't want that for our kids. We need to, we need to, we need to wake up and understand that what the Bible is telling us here, that there are wicked people that creep in unawares. Also of your own selves, verse 30, shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. I've seen that. I've seen it firsthand. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone day and night. One, everyone night and day with tears. This grieved Paul. He knew what was going to happen. And he warned them consistently, repeatedly, they're going to creep in. They're going to be among you. They're not going to spare the flock. Be vigilant. Be sober. Watch. Understand that this is going to happen. Especially in a church that's trying to accomplish something. I mean, this church is trying to reach the world with the gospel. And it's, and it's, and it's reaching its own area. I mean, it's reaching Phoenix. It's now we're reaching Tucson. We're doing great works. We're winning thousands to Christ. Don't you think the devil hasn't put just a big target on us? I mean, where would you put the target if you were the devil? Some lame church that's not doing anything for God? They might have the right gospel, but they're not doing anything with it. They're just preaching to each other, waiting until everybody just dies off and goes away, and who knows what will happen after that. Or would you go find a church that's doing something? Because let's face it, if we're taking it to him, we're his enemy. We have an enemy. And we're, if, we're, if he's our enemy, then we're his enemy. And there's a fight. He's going to take it to us. You say, well, what do, we, what do we do? Well, here's one thing I've noticed about these people that creep in. Eventually, they show who they are. Eventually, the wool gets pulled back, and you see the fangs. And you go, this is a wolf. Eventually, people will show their true colors. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. Then Herod, verse 16, Then Herod, when he saw he was mocked of the wise man, was exceeding wroth. And sent forth, and what did he do? This wicked man. He slew all the children that were in Bethlehem, and in the coast, all the coast thereof, from two years old and under. You know, sometimes we just read over these verses, and we don't think about how wicked this is. That a man would go and wipe out every child in a town from, from two years old and under? It's wicked. Notice there, I mean... He didn't say wiped out all the, 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 the boys. He says all the children. All of them. He was wroth. Show what he was really in his heart. But God protects his own. That's one thing we can take hope in. Is that God protects us. You know, I'll tell you something. These last few weeks here at Faithful Word and, you know, in the past, we've really dodged some bullets. We've seen some people that were just so close to going out and starting churches or things like that and just get cut down. We've seen people in other places, dens of iniquity, just being uprooted. And God bringing in a righteous, a righteous man out there in Fort Worth, taking care of business. We've seen, we're seeing great victories. Why? Because God protects His own. When we're doing right. At least we can know that we're going to be protected. I mean, Jesus was protected here. Look at verse 11. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with his mother, uh, with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. This is the wise men, of course. And they opened their treasures, and they presented him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. 
And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. God says, look, don't go tell Herod. Don't go back there. I know what he's trying to do. Verse 13. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeareth unto Joseph in a dream. God's warning these people. He's protecting his anointed. Appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be thou until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt. So God will protect his own. Yes, there's wicked men. Yes, there's infiltrators. Yes, there are those that want to do great harm to the work of God and the people of God. But God protects His own. Now, how does He do it? Did God come to Jesus and snatch Him up and carry Him away in a cloud? No. He used a human element. He used Joseph. He used the wise men. God uses human means to protect His own. He protects us the same way. He gives us overseers. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 13, Go ahead and turn over Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. I'm going to read to you from Hebrews 13. You're going to Romans 16. See, when God protects us, He's given us protection in our life, but He uses human people to do it. He uses a human means. It says in Hebrews 13, Obey them that have the rule over you. And right there are people, but they don't like that. The fact that God would suggest that there's people in your life that might have the rule over you. And submit yourselves. Why? For their own glorification so that these people can beat their chest and just feel like I'm ruling over people. For their own ego? No. For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account. You know why God gives us overseers? You know why God has appointed certain people in our lives spiritually to rule over us? To watch for our souls. To look out for us. To protect us. To warn us of the wolves that are trying to creep in. And it says, They watch for your souls as they that must give account. These people that rule over us, our pastors, they're going to give account. And He's pouring these people saying, Obey them, so that when they give that account, they may do it with joy. They can say, this one I, that, that you gave me, this sheep of yours, Lord, that you gave me to watch over and protect as an overseer. He made it. He's come through unscathed. He's been fruitful. He's kept his wool white. He's clean. He's got a reward. There's joy there. That's what the overseers want. They don't want it to puff themselves up take on all the trouble and the problems and the difficulties that come on with ruling over a flock. Like it's some kind of vacation. They do it because they care about people. They have a burden for people. They want to give an account with joy to the Lord and not with grief. It goes on and says, for that is unprofitable for you. You know, people want to buck the authority in the local church. The local church is going to keep steaming right on up with the head with them. You know, the door swings both ways. And people want to buck the local the pastor's authority in the local church. He'll give an account with grief. But that's not going to be unprofitable for him. It's going to be unprofitable for you, for the person who bucks. <clears throat> Faithful words have been going strong just fine. And you know, if I were to buck the authority over me, my pastor, our pastor, who rules over me and you, the faithful word would go right along without me. It wouldn't need me. It was doing fine without me when I got here, and it would do fine without me going forward. But it would be unprofitable for me. <clears throat> You're there in Romans chapter 16, look at verse 17. The Bible says, I'm going to get into something that's going to hit home with you. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions. Mark them. Mark them. He's saying, point them out. We look at this map, we mark the map, don't we? When we mark the map, we know where we've been. It's bright red. Can't miss it. You look over there, it's marked. He's saying, mark them which cause divisions. When someone comes into a church and starts to cause division, they're to be marked. Divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. 
You see, the pastor, the preacher gets up and he marks. Right? He says, this person, watch out. Then it's up to everybody else to avoid. And that's what a lot of people miss. They say, oh, so-and-so has gotten into sin, so-and-so is causing a division, so-and-so is causing an offense. But I'm still going to have them over for dinner. I'm going to still call them up, see how they're doing. Still get together and have a cup of coffee. That's not avoiding them. I'm not going to return the text message. Why? Because they've been marked. And my job is to avoid. Chapter 18. Chapter 18. Because we're trying to get through Matthew chapter 2 tonight. And somehow that got worked into the sermon. I, I don't know how you worked that into a Bible study, but we, we managed. The Bible says in chapter, or verse 18 of chapter 2, In Ramah, there was a voice heard. Chapter 2, verse 18. There was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted because they are not. This was, of course, after Herod had come in and you know, slew all the children under two years old. And notice the appropriate response of the people there. Lamentation, weeping, great mourning. Weeping for children would not be comforted because they are not. That's the appropriate death or appropriate response to the death of innocence. When we see life being snuffed out, it ought to bother us. And we're living in a world and a culture today that has just become so hardened to it. We watch it on our television, people just getting killed. We play it in our video games, people just getting killed. And we can become hardened to it. And we ought to be careful because the appropriate response here is weeping. It's lamentation. And I know it was children that had been born that were wiped out, but the fact is the same should take place for the unborn. The abortion that goes on in our country. And I missed this last week. I failed to mention it. If you would, just turn quickly back to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. You say, why should we worry about the unborn so much? Why, why should we weep for them? Well, because the unborn, that's a human being. That's life. The Bible makes it very clear that even in the womb, that child is a human being with a soul. You're in Matthew chapter 1. Turn to keep that place too, and then turn to Isaiah 7 while you're there. If you ever, this is just great to mark down in your Bible. And this is how you can show from the Bible that life begins at conception. Matthew chapter 1, verse 20. You're going to compare that with Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Go ahead and turn over to Isaiah 14, 7, 14. I'll read to you from Matthew chapter 1. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 20, But while he thought on these things, Behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her. Now when does conception begin? What is conception? It's when the seed of the man meets the egg of the woman. That is what's called conception. Right? Now I'll look at this. When, and of course, Matthew chapter 20 is... is, is uh, can be compared with Matthew chapter 7, verse 14. <clears throat> the Bible says, Therefore the Lord Himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and shall bear and call His name Emmanuel. So you can see there how conception is something that I'm, I'm, I'm missing something here. I'll come back to it. I, I, I'm losing my train of thought there. But the point is, I mean, if you really need to be convinced of when, when life begins, you know, in that you have to question whether or not oh, of that life that's growing, you know, that thing that's growing inside of you is, is a human being in a life, you know, you've been brainwashed. You've fallen victim to this, this world's hardness. But it says here, I want to just read a quick fact for you. In 2015, this is from the CDC. In 2015, 638,169 legal induced abortions were reported to the CDC from 49 reporting areas. So keep in mind, that's only from the people that are reporting to the CDC. 
The abortion rate for 25, 2015 was 11.8 abortions per 1,000 women aged 15 to 44. And the abortion and the abortion ratio was 188 abortions per 1,000 live births. Now, when I throw numbers out there, it's hard to follow along. So let me break this down to you. When you do the math, that comes down to 1,748 abortions per day in our country. 1,700 abortions per day. Let's break it down a little bit more. That's 73 abortions per hour in our country of just life just being snuffed out every hour. 73 of them snuffed out. You know, I don't want to get graphic and really drive the, 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 the point in about what goes on in an abortion. But it's gruesome, it's barbaric, it's wicked, it's murder. 1.28 abortions per minute, if you want to break it down further. And it says here in Matthew 18 that when the child, children died, there was lamentation and weeping and mourning, and appropriately it's so. But what do we see today? What is the cry today for the unborn? It's not the, it's not the cry of mourning, it's the cry of pride. It's people crying out, supporting this murder. It's women's health. Women's health. My body, my choice. Just throngs of women and men crying out, not in lamentation, not in weeping. Abortions on demand. This is a sign I saw. On demand, without apology. Not even sorry. No shame. They don't care what they're doing. And here's one I really, really appreciated. And just shows the wickedness that's in these people's hearts. They mock the word of God while they're committing this wicked act of murder. Of destroying a life before it even has its chance to draw its first breath. The sign, this wicked sign. Thou shalt not mess with women's rights. Philippians 1.22 that's wicked as hell, friend. That is a wicked heart that he would even think that something like that is appropriate, let alone funny. That's our country. We don't have people crying out with weeping and mourning. They're mocking the Word of God. They're mocking the things of God. They love death. And no, and no, no wonder, because they hate God. The Bible says, He that sinneth against me Wrong with his own soul, all they that hate me love death. My body, my choice, without apology. They love it. They'll fight for it. They'll march for it. They'll vote for it. They'll attack you for saying anything against it. Because they love death. Look at verse 19, we'll wrap up here. But when Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeareth in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise and take the young child of his mother and go to the land of Israel, for they that are dead, which they are dead, which shot the young child's life. And he arose and took the young child and his mother and came to the land of Israel. But when we heard that Archelaus did reign in Judea in the room of his father Herod, he was afraid to go thither. Notwithstanding, being warned of God in a dream, he turned aside to the parts of Galilee, and came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Now, here's just a much more lighthearted point to end on. Okay? And this might be something, because there's these goofballs out there that want to say that Jesus was a, had taken the Nazarite vow. Okay? Now turn over to Numbers chapter 6, last place we'll turn. Keep a finger there in Matthew 2. Turn over to Numbers chapter 6. And, you know, I'm, it's not something I want to delve deep into. I've run into a few people that want to make a big deal about whether or not Jesus had the Nazarite vow on him. And this is like one of the just easiest things to just dispel. It just, just this one passage. Because, first of all, if we look at Matthew chapter 2, verse 23, it says, And he, shall, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth, that it might be spoken, which was spoke, it might be uh, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets. He shall be called a Nazarene, not a Nazarite, a Nazarene. Why was he called a Nazarene? Because he dwelt in a city called Nazareth, right? I know this is real, right there on the surface. But people miss this, and you can show people like, no, no, they'll still, they'll still argue. It's just foolishness, I know. 
Now say, okay, well, maybe, did he take the Nazarite vow? Well, let's look at the Nazarite vow and see if Jesus, because Jesus, the Bible says that in him there, you know, there, there was no sin. You know, there was no sin. Jesus never one time committed sin, right? So if Jesus took the Nazarite vow, that means he could never could have broken that vow because that would have been sin, right? So let's look at the vow. Numbers chapter 6, verse 1, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When either man or woman shall separate themselves to a vow, to vow a vow of a Nazarite, so this is a Nazarite vow, to separate themselves unto the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and strong drink, and he shall drink no vinegar of wine or vinegar of strong drink, neither shall he drink any liquor of grapes, nor eat moist grapes or dried. And all the days of his separation shall he eat nothing that is made of the vine tree, from the kernels even to the husk. So Jesus couldn't have anything to do with grapes. Now, did Jesus ever have anything to do with grapes? Did he ever, did he ever make wine at that wedding? Right? Did he ever drink of the cup at the last I mean, he would have broken this vow. Agreed? So that right there, I mean, obviously in Matthew chapter 2, it's, it's pretty plain to see why he's called a Nazarene, and it's not a Nazarite. But if you need to, mark your Bible. If you ever want to run these goofballs, you can show them the vow and say, look, Jesus dealt with grapes. He dealt with the things of the vine. So that's my message this evening. Uh, Matthew chapter 2. Let's go ahead and close in a word of prayer.